Well, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Grace Point Church. We're so glad you're with us today. We want to welcome all of you that are here, and especially those of you that are joining us online. Thank you for being with us. The Bible says, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. And so it's going to be good today to be together. It's going to be good to hear from God's word, to worship him, to lift our voices and lift our hearts. Be reminded, the Bible says that all is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. In fact, we're going to look at that verse next Sunday morning as we continue our series called Mercy House. Um, I don't know how many of you are reading God's word with us, but we're doing the five-day Bible reading plan in 2021. And and this today begins week nine, and we've been reading uh, Leviticus and Hebrews. And uh, this week, we're going to read Psalm 81. And uh, I just want to read a couple verses from Psalm 81 to you this morning, and then we're going to pray together, and then we're going to just commit this time to the Lord. Listen to what Asaph said in the 81st Psalm. He said, sing for joy to God our strength. Shout aloud to the God of Jacob. And then listen to this verse, Psalm 81, verse 6. He says, I heard an unknown voice say, I removed the burden from their shoulders. Their hands were set free from the basket. Why do we sing for joy? Why do we celebrate God's goodness at a time like this, in this place, in this moment? Because the Bible says God has removed the weight, the burden It's like we're carrying this basket, and he says, I've set your hands free. I wonder if you're here this morning, and you came into this room maybe carrying some baggage, maybe personally, maybe your relationship, maybe financially, anxiety, maybe just emotionally. You ever feel like you've got the weight of the world on your shoulders? The scripture says, sing for God, sing for joy to to God, our strength, because he has removed our burden. That's what we want God to do today, to lift our burdens. The Bible says, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. So let's do that right now. Bow your heads with me and let's pray. And as we pray all over this room, those of you that are joining us online, wherever you are right now, just bow your heart and let's, let's go to the Lord and commit this time to him. Father, we thank you today that you lift the burdens, that you set our hands free from the baskets that we carry, the wheelbarrows that we carry behind us, the baggage that we, that we take through life. Lord, the anxiety, the, the guilt, and, and so many times the, the pressure that we face. God, today we just come before you and we want to sing for joy to the God of our strength. You said the joy of the Lord could be our strength. And so, Lord, today, would you just help us to lay down every burden, lay aside every distraction, and, Lord, focus and turn our hearts toward you, turn our hearts toward home, and turn our hearts toward heaven today as we focus on you. Lord, we pray for folks that may be here today that are hurting and struggling. God, today, would they find healing and freedom and grace and life in Jesus Christ. And we just commit this time to you and your your power and your name and your purpose. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen.
I've tried so hard to see it Took me so long to believe it That you choose someone like me To carry your victory Perfection could never earn it You give what we don't deserve it You take all the broken things And raise them to glory Cause you are my champion Giants fall when you stand undefeated Every battle you've won I am who you say I am You crown me with confidence I am seated In the heavenly place undefeated By the one who has conquered it all Now I can finally see it You're teaching me how to receive it So let all the striving see This is my victory You are my champion The giants fall when you stand undefeated Every battle you won, I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence, I am seated in the heavenly place, undefeated by the one who has conquered it all. Impossible for you, when I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down. I have the authority, Jesus has given me. Open up my mouth, miracles start breaking out. I have the authority Jesus has given me.
<laughs> amen, amen. Thank you so much, Gerald. Take your Bible and turn to Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3, and we're going to continue uh, our series. We want to welcome you to Mercy House. That's what we've been looking at. Uh, God said in Zechariah, I will return to Jerusalem with mercy, and there my house will be rebuilt. So we've been looking at some of the Bible blueprints for a, a happy, healthy life that we find here uh, in Zechariah. And in Zechariah chapter 3 today, we're going to look at the question. Today we're going to address the question, the question that every one of us has asked at one time or another. Some of us have asked this question. Some people are asking this question right now. And I'll guarantee you, everybody in this room is going to ask this question at some point. You might be thinking to yourself, well, well, goodness gracious, Pastor Stephen, you spent three years in seminary studying theology and, and history and all the deep, deep questions of philosophy, like who am I? Why am I here? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Which one of those questions is the question? Well, I don't mean a philosophical question. I'm not going to talk today about an intellectual question. I'm going to talk about one of the most personal and emotional questions we will ever face in life. In fact, God is going to address that question and give us a powerful answer here in this passage in Zechariah chapter 3. Brittany Cruz asked this question. She was on a flight from San Diego to Las Vegas, and, and she had been reading the Bible for the first time, really, uh, in her life. She was going through a tough time. Uh, what's interesting about Brittany Cruz is that as an 18-year-old girl, she was bright, she was intelligent, she was beautiful. Uh, she went to college, and as a college student, she, she became a cliche, in a sense, because she started working in nightclubs, and one thing went to another, and she started chasing bigger paychecks. And, of course, Brittany Cruz wound up being a dancer in a gentleman's club. And while she was there, this 18-year-old girl was approached by some producers, a couple of guys, who had noticed her in the club and, and said, you know, she would make a great actress. And she had, had she ever thought about being an actress, and they would like to uh, cast her in, quote, some romance films. <clears throat> well, of course, she knew what they were talking about, and she wanted the money, and she got involved. And seven years later, she had made 275 of these films. She had become basically one of the most well-known people in that industry. In fact, she had appeared on the Howard Stern show a couple of times, multiple times, and Howard Stern was so taken with her, he said she was the smartest woman in porn. I don't know what that necessarily means, but <laughs> Howard Stern said she was the smartest porn actress he'd ever met. She was making $40,000 dollars a month making these little independent films. But here she found herself on this flight looking at a copy of God's Word that looked very different from the copy you may be holding in your hand today. In fact, let me give you a picture of what was on the cover of her New Testament. David, there's the cover of the Bible that she was reading Everybody say it with me. You ready? Jesus loves porn stars. Say it again just to let that live here in this room. Are you ready? <laughs> say it with me again. Jesus loves porn stars. This copy of the New Testament actually was a copy of the Gospel of John uh, with a modern translation like Eugene Peterson's The Message or something. These Bibles were handed out at porn industry conventions and conferences. Have you ever heard of Comic-Con? 
where all the cartoon people are there and the, com- the characters are there and you can get signatures from all your Star Trek fans and all that, the Star Trek people that you like. Well, the porn industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. And they have these conventions and expos all over the world, all the time. Incidentally, did you know that 57% of the people who attend those conventions are females? It's not just men going to these conventions. 57% are women. And they go there to get signatures from their favorite actors and actresses and so on. And there was a man named Craig Gross in California who was a believer who started a ministry to help people who were addicted to porn. And through the ministry, he realized not only did he really feel called to help people find freedom from addiction to pornography, but also he he felt God, he and his wife felt God calling them to reach out to the people who were working in that industry and to want to share the gospel with people in the sex industry, both in front of and behind the camera. So what he and his wife would do and others in their ministry is they would go and they would rent booths at these porn conventions and they would give out free Bibles and on the cover of the Bible, it says, Jesus loves porn stars. And so Brittany Cruz found herself after seven years in that industry. She found herself reading a copy of God's word And when she opened the Bible, on the first page, it said, Yes, Jesus loves pastors and soccer moms and thieves and prostitutes. Jesus even loves porn stars. And she asked herself that piercing question. Could Jesus really love me? That's the question. Could Jesus really love me? You ever ask yourself that question? Could he really forgive me? Could he really accept me? Could God really use me? This morning, I want you to look at Zechariah chapter three verses one through ten because what God is going to do with Zechariah is he's going to take this question that we all face and he's going to take Zechariah's question mark and he's going to turn it into an exclamation point and he's going to talk to us about the reality of sin and the problem of guilt and the power of forgiveness look at what it says in Zechariah chapter three beginning in verse one Zechariah says, then I looked up, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 1, he says, then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. Doesn't that sound like a spiritual thing? Joshua the high priest, Zechariah has this vision, the high priest is standing before the Lord, the angel of the Lord. It sounds like we ought to start queuing up the worship band. This is going to be a real religious, spiritual experience. But here's his vision. He said, and Satan was standing at his right side. To what? To accuse him. The Bible calls Satan the accuser of the brethren and the father of lies. And in Zechariah's vision, God shows him. The high priest is there, but he's being accused. And look at what it says in verse 2. Now the Lord said to Satan... The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Look at that image. God says to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. This man that you see as this terrible, horrible, no good, very bad man. He says this man is simply a burning stick that has been snatched out of the fire. Have you ever seen a stick that's, that's, that's snatched out of the fire before it's consumed? It's charred. It's, it's, uh, its shape has changed. It's being, you know, it's literally being, de- it's deteriorating. 
Uh, it, it has the stench of smoke and sulfur. And he says, Joshua is like a burning stick that I have snatched out of the fire. And then look at the end of verse 4. It says, in verse 3, Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. Now Satan may be the father of lies, but let me tell you something. The most powerful lies always have some truth in them. The most powerful con is always rooted in some element of truth. And the reality is when Satan looked at Joshua, the high priest, and he said <clears throat> he was accusing him because of his sin and his shame and that he deserved judgment, God did not rebuke Satan because Satan was making it up. The Bible says in verse 3, now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes. In other words, Joshua was dirty. Joshua was a sinner. What, what Brittany Cruz asked the question, could Jesus really love me? You know what she said? She said, I know I don't deserve it. She said, I sell myself for money. How could he ever love me? I want to ask you an, an interesting question. Why do you think when God showed Zechariah this vision that the person he chose to be standing there in filthy clothes, facing the accusation of, of Satan himself, why do you think he chose Joshua, the high priest? In other words, is that the first person that would come to your mind when you're looking for an example and an illustration of someone who's sinful and filthy and dirty and needs forgiveness? Wouldn't the high priest have been the last person you would have expected to be standing there? In other words, it goes without saying that all the degenerate gamblers and the sex workers and the people who rob liquor stores and the addicts and everybody else, wouldn't it be, make perfect sense to see people that we normally think of as in need of forgiveness in this picture? And yet, who's the person that Satan is accusing? The most religious, the most upright. In other words, do you understand the Bible says, it is your best righteousness that is like filthy rags compared to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. People say, Pastor Stephen, are you one of these fire and brimstone preachers that says that my sin and guilt and shame is enough to earn me the condemnation of heaven and that I deserve to go to hell? And I No, 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 no. You completely misunderstand. It's not your sin that is enough to condemn you. It's you at your very best. It's me at my very best that is like filthy rags next to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so God shows him Joshua as if to say, hey, Zechariah, I want you to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild my temple. And if you'll return to me, I'll return to you. And there, with mercy, my house is going to be rebuilt. And it's as if Zechariah and all the people of Israel were discouraged and frustrated, thinking, how are we ever going to do this? We're the same people that made so many mistakes. We got sent to Babylon in the first place. We can't ever get our act together. And it's like God is saying, I'm not waiting for you to deserve this. I'm going to take you right where you are. And there's Joshua. And the Bible says in verse 3, Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes. What's the reality of sin? The reality of sin is this. If you have something to write with, jot this down. The reality of sin is that sin always brings pain. Don't you think Zechariah must have been just hurt? Wounded, frightened, even Joshua can't escape the, the holiness and the righteousness of God. There must be no hope for me and the rest of us. Sin always brings pain. But here's the truth. God's mercy brings healing. 
God's mercy brings healing. Another way of saying that is this. Sin hurts. Life hurts. Can I get an amen? Life hurts, friends. Sin hurts, but God heals. Listen to what it says in Psalm 38, verse 3. Look at this scripture. Psalm 38, in verse 3. The psalmist says, there's no soundness in my body because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of what? Because of my sin. Can I tell you, there is such a thing as being sin sick. Sin always brings pain. Did you know that psychologists and psychiatrists will tell you that 80% of their clients are in therapy simply because they cannot deal with guilt. It's guilt. You know what Ted Bundy said about guilt? He said, I never feel guilt. Why, Why would anyone want to feel guilt? That was Ted Bundy. You know, there are some people in our society that don't feel guilt. We call them psychopaths. (laughs) Let let me give you a quote about, about the guilty. Someone has said, the guilty don't just hate their sins. The guilty hate themselves. And and that 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 pain actually creates physical problems. Did you know in the New Testament, the Bible says people in Corinthians, uh, the church at Corinth was so mixed up, messed up, dysfunctional, they were literally turning the Lord's Supper into an orgy. Are, Are we all awake this morning? Something tells me no one's falling asleep today. This church was messed up. You know what the Bible says? Paul said, you guys need to stop behaving the way you're behaving. That's the reason some of you are sick and some of you have even fallen asleep. In other words, your sin can be so serious, it could take your life. Pastor Stephen, are you trying to scare me? I would if I could. I'm not proud. If I thought I could scare teenagers away from sin and pain, I'm telling you, I would do it six times a week and twice on Sunday if I thought it would work. Why? Because sin always brings pain, but God's mercy brings healing. You know, when Brittany Cruz was on that flight and she opened that Bible and she began to think about her life and try to wrap her head around this human dilemma, of how do I reconcile who I am with who God is? How am I ever going to connect with all my faults and all my flaws and all my failures? How am I ever going to connect to a perfect God? Isn't that really the problem of the human condition? What might have been helpful for Brittany at that moment would have been to look out the window of that airplane Because you understand at 30,000 feet, when you look down and see trees, have you ever noticed all the trees look the same? Well, some of those trees are 15 feet tall, and some of them are 20 feet tall. And to be seen from from the air, they got to be pretty big trees, but they're not all the same height. Some of those trees are 30 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet. Boy, there's some trees in the world that are 100 feet tall. And higher, but if you get up high enough in an airplane, they all look the same. Have you ever seen a picture of the earth from space? When you look at the the earth, when you see the world from God's perspective, the mile high city of Denver and the low country of South Carolina doesn't look any different, does it? The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Friends, Ted Bundy is a worse human being than hopefully everyone in this room. Would you agree? We hope. We hope there are no psychopathic serial killers among us here today. 
I think we would all agree, for the sake of argument, some people are worse than others. But don't you understand, in the light of God's righteousness and holiness, what is the difference between me and Charles Manson? It pains me to say this, but really, not much. Think about it. Did you know that the man who wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace, you know who he was before he got saved? He was the most vicious, ruthless, brutal slave trader before he came to Christ. That's who wrote Amazing Grace. You know who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament? The Apostle Paul. Who was he? A violent, bloodthirsty man, convinced of his self-righteous, who went around persecuting the church for a living and business was good. Let's bring it home here this morning for just a minute. Let's bring it home. Do you realize that there's a lazy, self-absorbed, conniving, fill-in-the-blank man who's preaching this sermon to you right now? The Bible says all have sinned and we all have fallen short of the glory of God. And do you know that Jesus said, if you offend the law in one point, you're guilty of them all. Did you hear that? If you offend the law in one point, you might as well have committed, in terms of your judgment and your standing before God, here's what he's saying. Can I take all that theological stuff and just put it in a nutshell? Here's the point. God doesn't grade on a curve. And and the reality is, life ultimately is a pass-fail test. And you want to know what the the test is? Jesus said, here's all you got to do to get to heaven by being a good person. If you want to earn your way to heaven, here's the only thing you got to do. It's real simple. Be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And if you can do that, then you don't need a Savior. What's the reality of sin? The reality of sin is, friends, if Joshua the high priest's clothes are filthy, there isn't any hope for the rest of us. This was a man who followed the letter of the law of the Old Testament, and yet God shows Zechariah in this vision. It's like God is saying, hey, Zechariah, do you see what I see? Notice in verse 1, he showed him Joshua. It's like Christmas in February. God is saying, do you see what I see? Sin brings pain, but God's mercy brings healing. Look at what he says in verses 4 and 5. He goes on. He says in verse 4, Now the angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. And then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put fine garments on you. And then I said, Put a clean turban on his what? On his head. That's very important. So they put a clean turban on his head and they clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. Isn't it interesting that not only did the the angel and Zechariah, they wanted to see Joshua cleansed. They wanted his filthy garments to be removed and and have new fine garments put on him. They wanted to deal with not only the, the pain of his sin, but they wanted to deal with the guilt of his sin They wanted him to be changed. See, they weren't just taking off the old, but they were also putting on the new. You know, someone has said that every negative emotion, like guilt and others, every negative emotion really has an important part in a a happy life. 
Negative emotions like guilt really play an important role in your life. They are a big flashing sign that something needs to change. See, there's really two kinds of guilt. There's good guilt and there's bad guilt. Good guilt comes from heaven and bad guilt comes from hell. You say, where do you get that from? Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. It says, for godly grief, another translation says godly sorrow, produces a repentance not to be regretted and leading to salvation. In other words, when you're sorry, when you grieve, when you have sorrow over your sin, godly sorrow, he said it leads to repentance. It's a call to action. It says something needs to change. But worldly grief produces what? Death. See, the reality of sin is that sin always brings pain. The problem of guilt is that sin always produces guilt. But what God does is God brings freedom. What part of Joshua's garment was so significant in these verses, in verses 4 and 5? They made special attention that let's put some clean, fine garments on him, especially put a clean turban where? On his elbow? Did they send him out for a mani-pedi? What part of his body needed to be clothed the right way? His head, his mind, his thinking. Listen to what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 24. Ephesians 4, 22 and following. He says, you took off your former way of life, The old man, corrupted by deceitful desires. Ephesians and Colossians both gives the same picture of your old life and your new life, like somebody taking off old clothes and putting on new garments. And look at what he says in verse 23. You are being renewed in the spirit of your, what? What? Mind. you got to be renewed In the spirit of your minds, verse 24, you put on the new man, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. You see, when we face, when we have sin that produces guilt, you got to do one of two things with that guilt. You've got to either embrace it and own it and confess it and repent of it and find freedom Or you try to hide it and stash it away and sweep it under the rug. And then it ends up corrupting you and and making you sick and bringing more pain and ultimately death. The Bible says that, that he says there's a problem of guilt. Sin always brings pain. It always brings guilt. But God not only brings healing, God will bring freedom. I love this phrase in... uh, Go back to verse 2 real quick. Zechariah 3, verse 2. Notice what, what, what the Lord said to Satan. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord what? Say it with me. The Lord rebuke. You see that word rebuke? Now skip over to verse 4. Chapter 3, verse 4. He says, the angel said to those who were standing before him, what? Take off his filthy clothes. Take it off. Remove it. Skip down to verse 9. Zechariah 3, verse 9. It says, See the stone I have uh, set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on that one stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty. And I will what? Say it with me. Remove. He says, I'm going to rebuke the accuser. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take away your filthy clothes, your sin. He says, I'm going to remove your sin. I'm going to take it away. I'm going to withdraw it. I'm going to send it away. Do you know where the phrase scapegoat comes from? Scapegoat. It comes from from a, a, a Middle Eastern cultural practice that what people would do in a, in a village is they would take their old coats, their cloaks, these heavy coats, And they would have a goat or a lamb in the village. And they would pick a scapegoat. And everyone would take their cloaks. 
And they would lay it over that animal. And that animal would be sent out into the wilderness and would take away and remove all of their sin. And that's the picture of what he's saying here. God says, I rebuke Satan. I'm going to take away your sin and I'm going to remove it from you. You know what it reminds me of? My son, Will, is, uh, is, is here today. And Will and I and, and Kate and others, we like to watch basketball sometimes on TV. We were watching a game last night on television. And Will, you know how sometimes when you're on the playground or even in the NBA, you will hear an, an NBA player or somebody say, this is my house. You ever heard somebody say that? I remember a few years ago when Dwayne Wade came back to the Miami Heat. He made a buzzer beater three right as the clock expired to beat the Golden State Warriors. And you know what Dwayne Wade immediately did, this grown man? You know what he did? He ran through the stadium like a child, like an eight-year-old. And he jumped up on the scores table and he looked up at the crowd that was going ballistic and he pounded on his chest and he screamed, what do you think he screamed? This is my house. This is my house. You know the, 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 the company Under Armour that makes sporting equipment and dry fit shirts and all that stuff? They have all these t-shirts that famously say, protect this house. What's God doing in Zechariah? He's rebuilding his house, the temple. And what does he say to the enemy? And what does he say about sin and guilt and judgment? He says, I'm going to take it away. I'm going to remove it. I'm going to rebuke it. You know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like a great shot blocker in the NBA. And what, what is somebody like Dikembe Mutombo or Rudy Gobert or Bam Adebayo? What do one of these great shot blockers do in the NBA? When they reject a shot, what they love to do is slap the ball into the crowd to intimidate their opponent. And what they will say is, get that something something. Get that trash out of my what? house. Get that out of my house. This is my house. You know what the Bible is saying here? What God is saying to us is that sin has to be dealt with and what God wants you to do is learn how to reject sin. Isn't that what the Bible says? Resist the devil and he will flee. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He says, God is saying, this is my house and I want to remove your sin. I want to send it away. I want to rebuke those who would accuse you. What is he saying? He's saying, I want you to renew your mind and realize salvation is not just a clean slate. Salvation is a brand new life. And, and what the Bible talks about in Ephesians that we just read is that not only does God take away all of our sin, but we are now dressed and clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what imputed righteousness means. If somebody says to me, Pastor Stephen, are you a righteous man? Doesn't it sound like a tricky question? Pat, are you a righteous person? Bill, do you consider yourself a righteous person? Gerda, when you think of yourself, do you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, boy, I am a saint. Is that how you feel? It, doesn't it make you uncomfortable even thinking about it? Why? Listen to me. The Bible says, if you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It has been imputed to you. Pat said the magic words, well, sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But see, what God has given you has nothing to do with your performance. It's a gift of his grace. And what he says is this, when Jesus died on the cross, he took all your sin and he applied it to that death. 
The wages of sin is death. He took all of your sin and he applied it as though he were a bookkeeper, a bean counter, with, with, a, with, a, uh, with a financial spreadsheet. And what he said was, I'm going to take all your liabilities and I'm going to apply them to the account of Jesus who dies on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin. But that's only half of salvation. God taking away your sin is only half of the equation. The other half is this. He says, I'm going to take all the assets of Jesus Christ, the goodness, the glory, the grace, the power, the the kindness, the compassion, the mercy, the love, the truth, the honesty, the faithfulness, the integrity. I'm going to take all the assets that Jesus accumulated in his life, and I'm going to apply them to your account. So, Gerda, when you look in the mirror and you say, am I a saint? The only biblical answer to that question is, yes, I am. But it has nothing to do with me. It's not what I did. It's what he did. Stephen, are you telling me you're a righteous man? Yes, I am. But it's not something I deserve or earned, or it's not based on what I do. It's based on the perfect, finished work of Jesus Christ. And incidentally, do you know how I know that has to be true? Because if you weren't a righteous person, how could you ever go to heaven? God can't look upon sin. He hates sin. God doesn't know a single sin he doesn't hate. But here's the great news. He doesn't know a single sinner that he doesn't love. You see, in verses 1 through 3, it's as though God is saying, hey, Zechariah, do you see what I see? And in verses 4 and 5, he's saying, Zechariah, do you hear what I hear? He showed him Joshua. Verse 4, he said to him. He says, can you hear what I hear? Sin brings pain. Sin brings guilt. But God's Mercy brings healing. God's forgiveness brings freedom. How does it happen? It happens by the renewing of your mind, of seeing yourself the way God sees you. And then finally, look at verses 6 through 10. Zechariah 3, verses 6 through 10. Now the angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. And what's interesting about that word charge in the language of the Old Testament is that the the word charge there comes from a root word that literally means to repeat, to duplicate. In other words, you're saying the same thing. When he says God gave him this charge, he's saying he's intensively repeating, he's he's duplicating his words. Have you ever had a, at, at our house sometimes Kids will say something to one another, and it'll be like, no, I didn't. And they'll say, yes, you did. I did not. Yes, you did. No, yes, no, yes. And a person is making their case by simply repeating the same thing. That's the the word picture of what he's saying here. God says, can you see what I see? Can you hear what I hear? And do you know what I know? Do you know what I know? Do you know that you know that you have tasted the forgiveness and the mercy of God? Listen to what he says. He gave him this charge. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you a place. Notice that word. I'll give you a place. He says, listen, if you'll just trust me, if you'll follow me, if you'll walk with me, if you'll obey me, he says, I'll give you a place among those standing here. That word place means free access. You'll have access to my house. The Bible says in Romans 5 verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. And through him, we now have access access to the Father. That's what grace means. 
that we can approach the throne of grace boldly with confidence. Why? Because Jesus has given you a VIP pass into the presence of God. Have you ever been to a concert? Anybody here ever been to a concert? Have you ever been to a concert where you had an all-access pass? Usually it's on a little card, laminated, and it's, it's on a thing around your neck. And it allows you to go back behind the curtain and, and, and to walk back and see the, the people that are there. In other words, who gets those passes? A very select group of people that have access that you can go back to the green room and you can go meet all the famous people. And what Jesus does here is he says, listen, if you'll just trust me, he says, look, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to take away your guilt. We're going to renew your mind. You're going to see yourself as a new person. And he says, you're now going to walk in a new way of life. And he says, I'm going to give you access to a life you never dreamed of if you'll just follow and trust in me. Listen to what he says. Go down to verse 8. He says, listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. I'm going to bring my servant, the branch. Now, this is a word that's used in Isaiah. It's used in Jeremiah. It's used here in Zechariah. Jesus, the Messiah, is called the branch. What does a branch do? A branch is what connects to the trunk, to the source of life and blessing. And what he's saying is if you want to be connected to God, you need to grab a hold of this branch because that connects you to the tree and ultimately to the root and to the source of God's love and grace. He says, see, I'm going to send my, my servant, the branch. Look at verse 9. He says, see, the, the, the stone I've set in front of Joshua, there are seven eyes on that one stone. And I will engrave an inscription on it. He doesn't tell us what the inscription is. Isn't it funny how many times in the Bible God writes something down, but he won't tell us what he wrote? Jesus wrote in the dirt. We read that just a few, day, a few minutes ago, or last week. And here he has this stone. He says, first of all, Jesus' branch, he's going to connect you to God. But he says, don't get too excited just yet. All I got to do is grab hold of that branch? Yeah, and let me tell you about that branch. He's like a stone that has seven eyes. In Hebrew, the number seven always is a symbol of perfection. What is he saying? He's saying Jesus knows everything about you. If you've made 275 pornographic films, it has not escaped the knowledge of God. But can I tell you something else? Because that stone has seven eyes, his knowledge is perfect and complete, which means some of us have never gotten into scandalous trouble simply because we were never in the wrong place at the wrong time. But the reality is, everybody in this room is capable of just about anything. Have you ever noticed that? People who would steal... A pencil. Listen, if you would steal a pencil, you'd steal a million dollars if you thought you would get away with it. You either steal or you don't steal. In other words, if you would lie about a little thing, you'd lie about anything if you thought you could get away with it. And here the Bible says, I'm going to send my servant the branch. He says, there's going to be this stone with an inscription. It's got seven eyes. It knows everything. He doesn't just know everything you've done. He knows everything you wanted to do but never had the opportunity. He knows everything you would have done if you'd have been in the wrong place at the wrong time. He knows what you thought about doing. And by the way, you know, sin is not just things we do. Sin is also things we fail to do that we ought to do. We always look at sin and, I think, compare ourselves to people who get involved in scandalous sin, like robbing a liquor store. And somehow we think in our minds, 
If I have failed to do good that God wanted me to do, I'm no better off than a person who robbed a liquor store. Do you understand the difference? Sin is sin. For him to know to do good and do it not, to him it's sin. And listen to what he says at the end of this verse. We're out of time. He says, says the Lord Almighty, look at the end of verse 9, and I will remove the sin of this land. And how's he going to do it? This God who sees with perfect omniscience, perfect knowledge, all of our sin, past, present, and future, how's he going to remove your sin? In a single day. In fact, it was in six hours one Friday when Jesus hung on the cross between two thieves, suspended between heaven and earth. Think of it. Jesus, you think it was an accident? You think it was an accident that Christ died on the cross before they invented lethal injection or electric chairs? You think it was an accident? But there he was, the branch suspended between heaven and earth to connect sinful man to a holy God. And all you got to do is take hold of that branch and you can be saved. He says, I'll remove their sin. How? In a single day. And then look at verse 10. In that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit under your vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. Oh, listen. Sitting under the vine provides shade. Sitting under the fig tree provides fruit and taste and luxury and joy. It's a picture of happiness, of blessing. He's saying, listen, you're going to have a blessed life, and you're going to realize you have been blessed to invite other people to the same party that I've invited you to. Let me tell you something. The greatest evidence of a person receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior is an immediate desire to share that grace and good news with other people that they know. You show me a person who's tasted the forgiveness of God, and you know what they'll want to do? They'll want to invite neighbors under their vine and fig tree to say, I can't believe what God has done for me, and I want you to experience this. I want you to know Christ. See, Brittany Cruz asked the question, Somewhere up in the sky between San Diego and Las Vegas, could God really love me? I know I don't deserve it. I sell myself for money. How could God ever love me? You know what she found? She found an answer to that question. God turned her question mark into an exclamation point. And you know where Brittany is today? But she's no longer Brittany Cruz. She's now Brittany Delamora. She's a wife and a mother. She is now the leader. She and her husband, who's a pastor, Richard and Brittany Delamora, are now the leaders of the very ministry that makes those Bibles. Now Brittany goes to those same conventions and expos. And she shares the gospel. And she'll, some young girl will come up to the table and she'll give her a Bible. And they'll talk. And she'll have this beautiful smile on her face. And she'll say, now in this Bible, if you'll turn to page 268, you'll read my story of how Jesus changed my life. You know what Brittany got out of sin? She got pain. Sin always brings pain. She had diseases, she had infections, she had all kinds of physical problems because of what she was doing. You know what else she got? She got guilt. That's what sin does. It brings pain, it brings guilt. She dealt with this guilt. Could God really love me? And you know what sin ultimately brings? Death. You know what happened to Brittany shortly before that plane ride where she met Christ? Through his word, she watched her boyfriend be stabbed and murdered in front of her. And she locked herself in a hotel room and tried to commit suicide. Why? 
Because sin brings pain. Sin brings guilt. And ultimately, sin, the wages of sin, is death. Any of you ever see a movie called Lean on Me? Morgan Freeman plays Joe, uh, the principal. Joe Clark, Patterson, New Jersey, takes over this crumbling school with all kinds of problems. First thing he does, he walks in. I want the name of every drug dealer, every miscreant, every criminal. And he puts them on a list. He brings everybody into the auditorium. And he has all these kids up on the stage. And he turns around and he says, you guys are crooks. You're criminals. And he says, none of you are going to graduate anyway. So we bid you farewell. Good luck. Goodbye. You're out of here. He expels dozens and dozens of kids to get them out of that environment. The next morning, Joe Clark shows up at school. And uh, when Morgan Freeman's character's walking up to the front door, there's this young boy that's there. His name is Thomas Sams. He's a freshman. He's crying. He says, Mr. Clark, there's been a mistake. I, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. You please forgive me. I can't tell my mom I, I got kicked out of school. Please give me another chance. He says, what's your name? Thomas Sams. He looks him up. Thomas, he says, you're a, you're, you're a crackhead. You smoke crack. No, I don't. I promise it wasn't me. He grabs him by the arm. He says, come with me. You Remember this scene? He takes his kid up on the rooftop of that school and he walks him over to the side and he says, fine. He says, go on and jump. The kid starts shaking. He's crying. And, uh, and he says, I don't want to die. Please, Mr. Clark, please give me another chance. And he says, don't you smoke crack? And the kid says, yes, but I've changed. I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it anymore. He says, son, if you smoke crack, don't you know what that's doing to your brain cells? It's killing your brain cells. If you want to kill yourself, I say do it expeditiously. If you're trying to kill yourself, we're here right now. You can jump off this roof. He says, I don't want to. He says, you're quite sure of this. He says, Sam's, this one time, I'm going to go back on my word, and I'm going to let you back into my school. What did he do? He showed him mercy. He gave him access. He gave him an opportunity for a life. Ernest Hemingway tells a story of a father and son in Spain who were estranged. And the teenage boy runs away from home to Madrid, the capital. The boy's name was Paco. Francisco, Nick, the nickname for Francisco is Paco. In, in Spain, in that time, the name Paco would be like Billy, Bob, or John in our society today. The father wanted to be reunited with his son. He wanted to restore fellowship with his son. And so the father went to Madrid, and he looked and searched high and low for his boy. But he couldn't find him. So finally, the father put an ad in the newspaper. And his simple classified ad said, Dear Paco, I love you. All is forgiven. Papa, meet me at the Hotel Montana Tuesday at noon. All is forgiven. Tuesday at noon, the father shows up in front of the hotel and he never found his son. But do you know who was there? The police. Because 800 young men had shown up on the square hoping it was their papa. Let's bow our heads and pray. If you're here this morning and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to tell you, he's not waiting for you to get your act together. He loves you just as you are. But I'll tell you what he loves. He loves you too much to leave you where you are. Today, would you open your heart and trust Jesus Christ? If you're watching online right now, you can pray a simple prayer. You can just say, Jesus, I believe in you. The best I know how, I put my life in your hands. 
Come into my heart. Come in today. Come in to stay. Forgive me of my sin. I trust you as my Savior and my Lord. If that's a desire of your heart, make that your prayer right now. Just say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Save me. Change me. The best I know how, I put my life in your hands. Maybe you're a believer here today, but you're struggling with pain, with guilt. You're discouraged. You're frustrated. Friend, today, would you take off those filthy garments? Would you let God put a clean, give you a clean, renewed mind? And walk in his spirit. Walk with him. Follow him. Trust him. And commit your life to him today. Recommit your life to Christ. Father, would you baptize this place and baptize these words in love and mercy and grace for Jesus' sake. Thank you for who we are in Christ. struggling with this particular fear in my life and I honestly told God I said no God I can't give this to you because I I can't trust you with this and I've always been a person riddled in fear I mean like a cat could walk by and I think I'm gonna get kidnapped and it sounds funny but it's just how I've always been and um this week God totally just removed this one particular area in my life that I just, I couldn't give it to God. And I know that whoever, wherever you're watching from and and anyone in this room, I know there's something that each and every single one of us we're struggling with and we're trusting, trusting God with. Whether it's finances or, you know, whatever's going on in the world, whatever that is, we're, we're asking you today to stand up with us and say the name Jesus. Even just a whisper it silences everything. And in Joshua, in the book of Joshua, the promised land was, Jesus promised the Israelites the, this, the promised land. And he told Josh, I'm going to use you to, you know, I'm going to use you. You're going to have all these, this land and, and, and yada, yada. But the promise is and will always be Jesus' faithfulness, Jesus himself, that he is your provider. He is all you need, and surely he is enough, and he will lead you to the place of abundance. It's all Jesus. We ask that you would just do that with us today. We're all in agreement. Just say Jesus. Over our nation, over your family, over your friends, there's someone, just say Jesus. He's all we need. It's just Jesus. Jesus. Who am I that the highest king? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Everybody say it. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free.
is tested like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today. Faithful you have been and faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me and that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips.
Amen. Amen. God bless you and be seated. And uh, I want you to do something this week. In the words of Christina, at some point in the next seven days, you're going to face a problem, a struggle, an issue, a question, maybe a hurt. Whatever it is, just say Jesus. Everybody say that with me right now. Jesus. Just say Jesus. And, uh, and trust in him. Listen, God bless you for being here. And uh, this Wednesday night, we're going to begin a brand new uh, midweek teaching series. We're going to do systematic theology. We're only going to do the first part. We're going to have eight lessons on systematic theology. But this month, we're just going to take the first four. The Bible, God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. So if you want to study systematic theology with us, it'll be Wednesday night, 7 p.m., online only. And I hope you'll join me and be a part of that this month. Also, Wednesday, we're going to have our game day outreach for kids. So if you've got a a child, kindergarten through the fifth grade, they can come out here Wednesday night for game day this month. We're going to have March Madness. There's going to be all kinds of fun games and free food and a lot of of great times. So parents and kids are welcome to join us. It'll be a great time. We do it in the courtyard. There'll be social distance. We'll keep everybody safe. But it'll be this Wednesday night. 6.30 6.30 until 8 p.m. That's game day. So I hope you'll be a part of that. Those of you watching online, tell your friends, your neighbors, Wednesday, 6.30 to 8, be a great opportunity for kids to come out and have a wonderful time together. Don't forget, you can always support the ministry of Grace Point Church. Just go online, gracepoint.net, click on the word giving, and you can help change the world one life at a time. For those of you here, we also have boxes in the back And so we encourage you to continue to give. Thank you for your your sacrificial, generous, gracious giving. And uh, we just love you. We're so glad everybody's here today. Have a great week. God bless you. You're dismissed.